Welcome to Jewels of the Trade. Today, we'll be looking at more unusual colored gemstones. How well do you know your colored stones? Bring your best gem guesses to the chat for this interactive Q&A. And if you're watching this video after the fact, be sure to check out the timestamps in the video description if you're wanting to learn about a particular stone. What do you guess this gemstone is? This mysterious oval cabochon exhibits chatoyancy, the gemological term for the cat's eye effect. It also has a noticeable color change when exposed to different types of lighting. Hint, this gem was discovered in the 1800s in Russia and was named after Tsar Alexander II. This one is actually natural, but typically if you see this stone in a jewelry store, it's probably lab grown. If you guessed Alexandrite, you guessed correctly. This stone belongs to my husband, Hunter. It is a 0.56 carat cat's eye Alexandrite from India. It's small and it's not very high quality. It's only about a $300 stone. Cat's eye Alex, if you can even find it, commands extremely high prices in larger sizes and finer qualities. Pop quiz, let me know in the chat, where is Alexandrite? on the Mohs scale. Cat's eye crystal barrel is usually somewhere between a honey brown and an apple green color. When crystal barrel has color change, it's called alexandrite. Russian alexandrite is famously called emerald by day, ruby by night because of its drastic color change from green to red. Russian material is rarely seen today as it's been depleted for over 100 years. Hunter Stone, featured in this video, is from India. Because of the scarcity of Russian Alex, the highest quality of natural Alex that you'll usually see in a jewelry store is actually from Brazil, which tends to be like a bluish green and a reddish violet. Chatoyancy in Chrysoberyl is caused by light reflecting off of rutile inclusions in the stone. This is different from chatoyancy in jade, so I've included a link in the video description to my video with Washington Jade about cat's eye nephrite if you want to learn more about that. We talked about rutile last week when we examined rutilated quartz. Check out the link in the video description. Who all is here? Say hi in the chat. It's time to answer the trivia question. What is alexandrite on the Mohs scale of mineral hardness? And the answer is eight and a half. The Mohs scale of mineral hardness is a one to 10 scale demonstrating a mineral's ability to scratch another mineral with diamond being the hardest or most resistant to scratching at a 10, meaning that it can scratch everything 10 and below. Sapphire and Ruby are famously nine and alexandrite is an eight and a half, making these stones fantastic for everyday wear. If you all guess this gemstone correctly, I will be utterly shocked. This is a level five mystery gem. So don't feel bad if you get this wrong. Leave your guesses in the chat. This gem is green. He's from Afghanistan. He loves long walks on the beach and candlelit dinners because he is chatoyant. Yes, this gemstone also has the cat's eye effect. Don't be shy. Leave your guesses in the chat. This stone is a type of amphibole. I'm going to give it away. And we have talked about it before on the channel. I'm going to give you a huge hint. This gem is a type of asbestos. It's obviously not dangerous to wear in jewelry, but if you crushed it up and inhaled the dust, that would be really, really, really bad for you. It's a five to six on the Mohs scale. And to be quite honest, we have sort of talked about this stone on the channel before, but I have never seen this stone as a single crystal gemstone actually set in jewelry. Hi, two genders. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. I think you're going to be really excited about this gemstone reveal. This is tremolite. If it were pure magnesium tremolite, it would be white, but because it has iron in it, it's green. Tremolite is a member of the actinolite tremolite series, so some stones can actually be both. Not all tremolite is jade. The stone we're looking at right now is not jade. However, nephrite jade is a massive microcrystalline variety of tremolite actinolite. 
Massive microcrystalline, meaning that instead of one crystal, nephrite jade has thousands of microscopic crystals in its makeup. But it's considered massive microcrystalline in some cases because you can actually see the individual crystals in some nephrite specimens, especially if you look with magnification. Chemically, you can argue that single crystal tremolite and nephrite jade are the same. The difference really is the crystal size, orientation, and proximity. So tremolite is not a type of jade. Nephrite jade is a type of tremolite, or at least in cases where nephrite jade is white and sometimes when it's green. Of course, some or maybe most non-white nephrite jade is a complex mix of actinolite and tremolite. A thumb is a finger, but a finger is not a thumb. Does that kind of make sense? Do you disagree? Do you think this should be called nephrite? Please discuss in the chat and comments. I am very interested to hear your thoughts. Keep in mind that diamonds and graphite are both entirely made of carbon, yet one is the hardest natural material on earth and the other is so soft that it's used in pencils. A gem's identity is more than just chemical composition. If you want to dive into a deeper conversation about this topic, join the Jot Discord server where we have collected articles and images of jade subtopics. You can chat with jade collectors, sellers, miners, researchers, and aficionados about all things jade. The link is in the video description. Drop your guesses in the chat for this yellow trillion cut gemstone weighing 0.51 carat. He hails from Pakistan. This little guy is a jeweler's nightmare. This stone is a five and a half on the most scale, and many jewelers refuse to set them in jewelry because this stone has a reputation for breaking easily. This stone is trichroic, meaning it appears to have a different color when viewed along different crystallographic directions. Tanzanite is actually another gemstone that is famously trichroic. If you haven't figured it out already, you will soon. Keep guessing. This gemstone has very strong dispersion, an effect that causes the little rainbow colors that gemologists call fire. Dispersion occurs because in certain materials, white light travels through the stone at different speeds, causing the white light to disperse into its spectral colors. Have you figured out what this gemstone is? This gemstone is called sphene or titanite if you hate the word sphene. Sphene is doubly refractive like moissanite, which is partly why it's really hard to take video of. Sphene can be very expensive, but this stone was cheap because of the size. I paid less than $100 for this stone because it's, it's side stone sized. One day, I would like to have a larger sphene in my collection because some sphene can be radioactive. It's not enough to be dangerous, but to be honest, even if it were, I would still probably want it. I would just keep it in a lead box with my other radioactive things. So, okay, everyone, if you could give sphene a different name, what would it be? Let me know in the chat if you would keep the name sphene or if you would call it something different. What do you think this gemstone is? This you may have actually seen before. <laughs> this little guy is from Cambodia, which is a huge hint. He weighs 0.85 carat and is also famously doubly refractive, which means that when light enters the stone, it changes direction or refracts and then splits into two rays of light that travel through the gem at 90 degrees to each other. The way I can tell if a gemstone is doubly refractive is by looking at the facet lines. If I feel cross-eyed because I'm seeing double facet lines, it's either doubly refractive or I need to go home. Two genders says the blue stone is pretty. Two genders, what do you think it is? Do you have a guess? It looks like you had guessed that the tremolite, I'm guessing, was Nephrite's stepbrother. That's hilarious. That's a really funny way to put it, too. I think I'm going to have to use that. <laughs> oh, somebody guessed that it's iolite. No, iolite is usually more purple. Um, iolite can sometimes pose as a sapphire simulant, though, so it can look a little bit more like sapphire. This is a lighter color blue than sapphire, tanzanite, and iolite would be. Let's go ahead and reveal the gemstone. This is blue zircon. Trivia time. What is the other name for blue zircon? 
Zircon has been very popular this year, which is great because it's a very underrated gemstone. The problem, in my opinion, is the name. Everyone knows that cubic zirconia, zirconia, is a fake stone. So I think calling a natural stone zircon is subliminally misleading, even though it's the accurate term. Also, I think people associate blue topaz with blue zircon because they're both December birthstones along with tanzanite and turquoise. And blue topaz, frankly, is kind of cheap. Like it's known to be a cheap stone in medium qualities. And it's not necessarily rare on the jewelry market because manufacturers treat topaz to turn it blue and make it acceptable for jewelry wearing. This is one of the many reasons why I think blue zircon seen here is actually a far superior stone. So the answer to the trivia question, what is the alternate name for blue zircon, is Campbellite, named after its Cambodian origin. Personally, I love this name, and I think it's way better than zircon. I wish we all called it Campbellite. Zircon comes in many colors other than blue. My favorite is actually yellow. Ask your local jeweler about zircon. They'll honestly be so thrilled to talk to you about it. It has a hardness of six to seven and a half on the most scale. So I probably would recommend it for you to wear every day, depending on your lifestyle. If you're really hard on your jewelry, maybe not. But if you're careful with it, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to wear this every day. What do you guess this gemstone is? This is one of my favorite gemstones, and this piece from my personal collection is very important to me because it was a gift from a friend in the industry. Her husband had actually cut this stone, and the cut is absolutely fantastic, much better than any other that I have seen in this gem type. I am definitely open to ideas on how to have it mounted, so let me know what you think in the comments. Maybe I should pair it with that sphene somehow. Ooh, two genders. How can you tell if it's fake on the blue zircon? So in my opinion, like the double refraction or the birefringence is going to be a really, really good tell. So when you look at it under a microscope and you see the doubling of the facet lines, that's a pretty good indicator that it's blue zircon. Also, blue zircon is not necessarily like in this quality going to be valuable enough to fake necessarily. I think the question typically is, is this blue topaz, is this aquamarine, which would be much more valuable than blue topaz, or is this blue zircon? And like I said before, identifying it as blue zircon is pretty easy because of the double refraction, which a gemologist who's trained with a microscope or a loop is going to be able to identify that really, really quickly. And even like the the well-educated customer is going to be able to identify that as well. So I hope that that was helpful. Oh, Grandidia right was a fantastic guess. It's <laughs> this one's blue zircon. It's not Grandidia right, but that is an awesome stone, and I would love to have Grandidia right on my channel. I don't have that in my collection. It is a super, super, super rare stone. So. Did I show you the pavilion of this stone? I feel like I didn't. Here's the pavilion. So this is, the pavilion is like the bottom of a gemstone, right? You have like the table, which is the top. And then you have the culet, which is the widest part. And then the pavilion, which is what we're looking at here. It's the bottom of the gemstone. Exceptional craftsmanship. You can see all of these facets are really well shaped. There's a whole bunch of them. The way it plays with the light is just incredible. I don't even understand how cutters do it. Like, it's so small. How do we do this? Did you guys have any guesses on what this gemstone is? I think it's time for the reveal. Do you guys remember last week when we talked about Mexican fire opal and how this specimen that we looked at last week was not gem quality? Well, this specimen is gem quality. This is Mexican fire opal, characterized by its orange-red color. It can be up to a six and a half on the Mohs scale, but it can break pretty easily. So you want to be super careful with it. Australian and Ethiopian opals are almost never faceted, but Mexican fire opal actually is sometimes, as in the case of this stone here. Like jade, fire opal was prized by multiple ancient Mesoamerican civilizations, including the Aztec and Maya. Someone guessed that this was a ruby. If you saw it in person, I don't think you'd think it's a ruby. And yes, it is red, but in real life, it's more of an orange red. And Mexican fire opal has what we call play of color. Now this, you can't really see it because play of color usually is like a rainbow of colors that comes out of opal. But there's this quality to this stone. 
it's almost a flash of light. Let me see if I can pull up a clip that shows it better. Where you kind of get this like jelly look almost from it. Where it kind of looks like it's glowing from within. That is very, very indicative of fire opal. And that's what's going to make it more easily recognizable. And it's what's going to help you set it apart from stones like ruby and garnet. What makes it gem quality? So let me show the example again of last week's Mexican fire opal. So this one was not gem quality because it's in matrix. It's kind of a weird shape. Like it's pretty, but only like a part of it's pretty. Like the rest of it is kind of clunky and bouldery. So when you have a gemstone like this, where it's like it belongs in jewelry, um, it doesn't look like a rock, right? It actually looks like like a fine gem. That's how we characterize gem quality. And of course, this is going to be subjective depending on the professional. But I think just about everyone in the industry would agree that this is gem quality and that this is just kind of like an inexpensive, fun novelty piece that you could still set in jewelry. But Something like this is typically going to go in sterling silver, whereas something like this, you're going to want to set in gold, usually 14 or 18 karat gold, because it's nice. I mean, it's it's rare and it's unusual and it needs to be preserved. So I hope that answers your question. Can you elaborate on opals? Yes. So opal is actually, it's a, it's a silicate. So you have quartz, which is also silicon and oxygen, and that has a very specific crystal structure. Opal is amorphous, meaning that it doesn't have a crystal structure. So when you have um, like a lot of silica in water that seeps down into like rock or even onto fossils and things like that, when the water evaporates out and leaves behind the silica spheres, it forms opal. So you can actually have like opalized fossils or opalized wood, right? Opalized specimens. It's really, really incredible, like just from the geological perspective. And when we're talking about like gem quality opals, there's usually certain things that we're looking for. We're looking for certain colors. Uh, red tends to be very, very valuable in opal. We're looking for a phenomenon called play of color, which was demonstrated here when you can see like this like sort of rainbow of light that sort of billows or moves around inside the stone. We call that play of color. That's something that makes it a gemstone. You can um, you can have opal as like just a just a specimen or just a mineral, but honestly, even in that form, it's going to be really really expensive, really really valuable. So typically, you're going to see opal more as a gemstone in jewelry than you are in like a mineral form. I don't know if you guys saw Uncut Gems. Was that the movie with Adam Sandler where he had the big black opal that the basketball player thought was lucky? You should check it out. It's a really interesting movie. They they say the F word a lot, but <laughs> it's still really good. And uh, it wasn't like, I think the piece in real life wasn't actually as valuable as they said it was. But it was just a really interesting like perspective on how value is assigned to opal. Opal has been revered for all of time. Like as long as humanity has had contact with opal, they have loved it. And really it's it, part of it's that play of color. We have Australian opals, which is where like 90 or 95% of opals on the U.S. market come from. And those are typically going to be like your gem grade, high quality opals. And in Australia, you have white opals, you have boulder opals, you have black opals, black opals being the most valuable of the opals. And then you have fire opal from Mexico. And then you also have Ethiopian opal. And Ethiopian opal is still really beautiful, but typically it's not going to be valued quite as highly as Australian opal. That is something I would love to talk more about on this channel. So if you guys have questions about opal, please leave them in the comments and I'll be sure to do a later video on it. Thank you for spending your Tuesday night with me, everybody. I hope you have a great week. And the next live stream is going to be about Jade. So leave any questions that you have or ideas about a Jade live stream in the comments or join the Discord and share your ideas there. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.